Hello, everyone. My name is Mary Robinette Cole. I'm here with my friend John Scalzi. We're going to be talking about his book, Starter Villain. And joining us is my special guest and uh, co interviewer, Elsie. Elsie, yes, hi, Elsie. Elsie was one of the inspirations for the cats in Starter Villain. She uses buttons to talk. We'll see how engaged she is. She did have some reviews and notes about the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that that I'll try to share with you as we go. Right now, it looks like she's engaged in some grooming. I did try to let her know, but hair and makeup for cat, it just takes forever. Sure. One of the first questions that I have about Starter Villain is entirely personal to us, which is, when did you decide to put the cats in? The cats, I think, were always there. And part of that was... Cats are just a trope for villains, right? They have, you got Blowfield, you've got Mr. Evil, you've got the evil cats in the animated film Bolt, which I love. Wheresoever there is mastermind villainy, so there is also a cat. And so it just seemed like the cat should be there. But one of the fun things to do with the tropes that everybody knows is to subvert hey. them and to make them and make them a little bit different. That was the point. That was the point of having the cats. They were there from the beginning. Elsie would like to know why you did not offer any of the cats fancy seaweed. In fancy seaweed? Fancy seaweed. Fancy seaweed is her preferred brand of teriyaki seaweed snack. This is a valid question. There is within the book some discussion of what the cats eat and and how the human should feel about what the, what he feeds to the cats. And I would say that in, in our lives, in the real world, <coughs> our cats are fed the basic sort of kibble, but every once in a while they'll get the greenies and some other sort of treats. We will try different treats to see what they like. And it happens that we actually have two types of cats. We have sugar and spice who are like, why are you trying to feed me things that are not things that I'm supposed to eat? Don't give them to me. Um, and then there's Smudge, who literally gets up on my shoulder and says, hey, what are you eating? <laughs> uh, and this is actually uh, much more um, pronounced whenever the dog is nearby. Um, if Charlie is eating something from us, then Smudge has to be eating something from us. And if Smudge is getting something, then Charlie absolutely has to be getting something as well. Those two are a package deal, whereas sugar and spice are, are just like, whatever, man. So her next question is bug hair tie. Obviously, she is concerned about the role of cats in spying. Hair tie, hair tie is means to throw things. So I think she's wondering why, if they knew that bugs were in the home, they did not just throw them out. Do I have that correct, Elsie? Give me a high five if I did. Thank you. I did have that. Great. I think that part of the reason that the cats would not have necessarily had any problem with the bugs is that, as they say, there are no knowns. And when they have, if they know that the bugs are there, then they know that they can actually manipulate them to give the information that they want to provide, not the information that the other people think they are getting. As far as it goes, the thing is, if you know that the spy technology is there, or if you know somebody else is a double agent or any of that sort of stuff, you don't want to stop them from doing whatever it is they do because that gives away the game. So quite clearly, the what the situation there is, is that you will need to use that to feed them the information that you want to provide them, thus adding a, an additional layer of disinformation and giving you an advantage over your foes. What do you think about that answer, Elsie? Fancy seaweed kibble. Fancy seaweed kibble. Pay dirt, I believe, is what she's telling us there. Fantastic. Um, I'm glad that we've got that straightened out. Do, do you need, we just did fancy seaweed. Do you want kibble now? Do you want to show John your tricks? No, you're going off. <laughs> she's she's like, done with me. She's done. She's done. I, she, yeah, she had no questions. more questions. She had priorities. She needed to know the answer to the, those things. And now we're moving on. Yeah, she's um, flipped the table. She's on the way. She did have feelings about the, uh, the meow mix. That was... Sure. As, as well page. she should have. Yeah. Hello. She's back. You're back. So do you... 
Would, would you, do you like the book? Was it like something that was worthy of a standing ovation? Yeah, good. <laughs> it's funny how many people ask me which of my cats is in the book, right? And I tell them that none of them are, not in that particular book. Yeah. Um, but I also, but I always mention Elsie specifically because of the button board and because of everything else. I do tell people if they want a book of mine that actually has my cats in it, aside from the fact that Starter Villain is dedicated to my cats, then they should read Fuzzy Nation because Fuzzy Nation, oh, yeah. Fuzzy Nation, they the fuzzies, all their personalities map directly to cats that I had, right? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's Papa brilliant. Fuzzy was lopsided cat who was the big, almost Maine Coon sized cat that we had. And then Mama Fuzzy and Baby Fuzzy both were Fluffy, my cat Fluffy, you remember? Mm -hmm. I remember Fluffy. Infamous bacon cat. And then Pinto was it was my, my cat Zeus, who his role as basically chaos provider has now been taken over by Smudge. And then the Grandpa Fuzzy was the oldest cat that I had named Rex, who I had back when Chrissy and I had started dating. And so all of the cats, their personalities are recognizable in each of the fuzzies. Although obviously you have to be me to know that. Specific. Yeah, I, I love that. Have any of you, your dogs made it in? Charlie's name in Starter Villain, that's oh. the, Charlie is the name of my dog. But I Did will not say- make that connection. No, neither did I until about halfway through the book, right? <laughs> Where I was like, where did I come up? Because someone, I, I think Chrissy asked me, he's like, why did you name Charlie? It's, did you name him after a dog? And I was like, I didn't think so, but now I figure I actually did. Because I knew that I was putting so many cats in, yeah. that my brain was going, no, you actually have to balance this out. You got to put in, you got to put in your dog. I have had dogs in, in the books before, but not really any of my dogs per se. In Android's yeah. Dream, there was a dog yeah. featured that was an Akita. And I had an Akita, which is oh, one of the is. reasons that I did it, because I knew the dog breed. And then, of course, and again, in Fuzzy Nation, there's Carl, the dog. But I see Carl more as a lab, and I absolutely never owned a Labrador. Yeah, they are. Having a, lived with a Labrador, my mom's service dog was a, a lab and highly trained, incredibly devoted, but still definitely a lab. Um, yeah. <laughs> like eight corn cobs, everything. Litter yeah. box. Yeah, Elsie believes that this is a litter box situation. Litter box. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Dogs in general eating things that they shouldn't be, very litter box. We're used to, we don't have that problem with our current dog. And I, the other two dogs, we had Daisy and then we had Cody. And both of them were huge fans of the litter box snacks or kitty roca as we called it back in the day and but charlie doesn't seem to want to have any of that which is fine with me there's there's something to be said about having a dog that when she comes up to you she her breath doesn't smell like yeah yeah but but that yeah. doesn't mean that she's too dainty for words she will she has happily eaten all manner of poop that is in our yard because we get a lot of deer and we get a lot of other animals and she's this is my banquet yeah yeah guppy is very much she's actually pretty good but she what she wants to do is roll in things yes shortly after she arrived elsie said kibble litter box i'm like that doesn't make any sense and then turned around and saw guppy with her head in the litter box and was like yeah. okay yeah we what charlie does like to do charlie does every once in a while like we have five acres of land, so we let her wander around. And most, and 98% of the time she's good. And then that 2% of the time she gets her look in this eye. And as soon as you see that look, you're like, don't do it. Don't do it. And then she runs off and she runs off to the neighbors because the neighbors have horses. And <laughs> Charlie loves the horses, but even more than she loves the horses, she loves finding just the biggest mound of horse puppies that you can and just doing full full rotation yep. and so immediately when she comes home she eventually comes home and then of course we have to drag her into the bath and shower her off and she's deeply offended that all her effort getting herself to smell like a horse poop has been just completely it's gone literally down down the drain but 
there is while I can appreciate that dogs do the things that dogs do because do they do the things they do, it doesn't mean that we want to smell them. No, it does not. Uh, and I know what you mean about the, they're mostly fine. And then just get an eye. We have a look in their eye. We have 12 acres and Guppy will just sometimes be like, not enough. Yes. Off they not go. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did actually have another book question. <laughs> okay. One of the things that, that I enjoy with your work is that a lot of times you will base places on things that you have a personal connection to. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering if the bar is someplace mm -hmm. that it, it felt like a, a place, yeah. but I'm wondering if it's just the archetype of that type of bar in the Chicagoland area, or if there is a, if there is a specific one that you were thinking of. Not only is there a very specific bar in Barrington that it's based on, but as I was writing the book, that bar was for sale <laughs> for $3.4 million. Oh my right? goodness. Word. So Word. the Charlie going Word. into Word. the bank to get the loan uh, for $3.4 million is directly based on the fact that bar was for sale. And it's not called McDougal's in the real world, but it's called Mix something or other. Yeah. It's enough so that people Word who are from Darrington will open it up and they will be, I know exactly Word where box. it is. Not only where it is, but it's the place it is in the book is actually the street corner that it's on in real life. Likewise, there is a cemetery, a mortuary mm -hmm. in Barrington. It's called Chesterfield, which is why mine is called Davenport. Right? <laughs> Good. Um, yes. Just like I said, just enough so that anybody who is from Barrington will be like, oh my God, is he from here? Does he know people here? And the answer is I knew people who were from Barrington when I went to the University of Chicago, right? But more recently, I have a friend who's a musician and he's in a he's in a band that's called the Academy Is. It was a emo band back in the early twentieth twenty first century. And one of their their last album that they released was called Fast Times at Barrington High because William went to Barrington High and all that sort of stuff. And I believe that I was like listening to that album when I was starting to do the writing. And so I was like Barrington. Why not Barrington? Because I needs to be somewhere. And I know the Chicagoland area because I went to the University of Chicago and all of that sort of stuff. So it just all fell in that way. The sense of place that you're getting there absolutely is intentional. I wanted it to be something that someone who was from Barrington would know exactly what was going on. And for everybody else, it would be like, oh, okay, there's a bar. Let's know. We know exactly which bar. That yes. Is. Yes. Did you ever, did, I was not clear from that. You have been in that bar? Litter box. No, I have not, unfortunately. That, see, I was. Elsie, Elsie just did call bullshit on this when she said litter box. She's like, he hasn't been. No, no. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't been in it. But that's, it was the, I did tell Chrissy, my wife, at one point, I'm like, I have to take a research trip to Barrington. She says, really? <laughs> you have to? And I'm like, yeah, I do. <laughs> But then I just started writing in it and it, it was fine. But the nice thing about being a writer today is that mm -hmm. there is enough information online that even if you can't get to the place, you can still have an idea about stuff. And so this bar that was for sale for $3.4 million had a hundred pictures in it, in the listing. So I basically walked through the, the, the entire building virtually and for the purposes of this thing, it, it seemed to work. Just backing up, you said that it was, you discovered that it was for sale while you were writing it. So the fact, was that a plot, it sounded like that was a plot point that you decided to add when, that, that it was for sale, that you decided to add that when you discovered so, it was for sale? So what happened was when I was doing the, when I was doing the research about the character Charlie being in Barrington, I knew he was going to be a substitute teacher and I knew that he needed to be in a position where he wanted to improve his circumstances, but was not necessarily able to. But while I was looking through Google maps at, at where his house would be 
and, and all of those other stuff, I did come across the bar. And I was like, oh, that looks interesting. And then I looked up the bar and then I saw it was for sale. And then uh -huh. I was like, now that makes sense. And this is one of the things that I think there are a lot of people who very tightly outline and plot and all that sort of stuff before they start writing. And I've never been one of those people. I've been one of those people who meanders during their research and finds interesting things that I will then try to employ. So ha having done the thing where having the virtual walkthrough of the town of Barrington made it easier for say, oh, he wants to get the, he wants to get the bar. That's the thing that motivates him. And then when I was like looking at the, when I knew that the uncle was going to pass away and there had to be a funeral service. And I looked at the, the place and all the details of the place are the details that are of the actual mortuary home and all that sort of stuff, which then in itself inspired going into the viewing room. And then when they go into the viewing room, all yeah, the horrible things that they try to do to the corpse. Right. She is taking full advantage of the fact that I'm doing this to just ask for kibble. Usually her conversation is slightly more interesting than this. Um, <laughs> She's got your number. She knows it's about. All right. If you now, now you have to do training. Training. Okay. Roll over. Yeah. I'm going to make you do that again because I had the camera set so high no one could see you do it. I mean, can see a little bit. There. Roll over. Good job. Nice. Okay. Patty cake, baker's man. No, come on, baker's man. Thank you. <laughs> this uh, uh, people wonder how you spent the pandemic. This is how I spent it. Reasonable, much better than what I did. I spent my pandemic buying musical instruments. Yeah. I want to say, I want to say that I spent it learning how to do music. But no, what I actually did was I bought a whole bunch of musical instruments. And then finally, I had to go, I have bought too many things. I must actually learn how to play and use some of them. I know? mean, at some point, that seems like... It seems reasonable enough. People buy books and we don't read them all. No, but the thing is, is one, it's aspirational to have the pile of books. Yeah. You, you at least think you're going to get through them. But at a certain point, when you buy a, uh, like I have a eight string Mando or, or caster. So uh -huh. what it is, it's a guitar sized mandolin strung like a mandolin, but it's eight strings and all that sort of stuff. And I bought it just because I thought it looked cool. And then I had it and I was like, am I ever going to play this? And so I had to have that moment of reckoning for myself. It's stop buying stuff that you're never going to use yeah you know, at least with the books you're like i could one day crack that open and read it books do take up less space they do take up slightly less space the later. thing that really got me was foods. yes you can have foods later the, th <laughs> the thing that really got me was i bought a keyboard right and i thought and i bought this thing that was called a fan uh, a phantom eight it's a roll in phantom eight and i thought that it was going to be about this size and it arrives and is nearly as tall as me right? <laughs> and it, it's a full-fledged workstation so you don't even need to have a computer attached to it anything and i looked at it and i realized that one i'd overbought i just like like going to the buffet and just piling everything yep. on your plate right and the other thing was that i was terrified of it because i was like there's there is too much here i don't know mm -hmm. what i'm going to do Better with box. all of this and yeah. so i have ended up I've learned to actually play my guitars and my basses and everything else, but the Phantom 8 is still in my basement just mocking me because it's okay. like you're not ready for you're not ready for me, child. Go go play with your go play with your ukulele or something like that. <laughs> so, the good news is I think the way that I'm gonna solve this problem is I'm going to install it into the church. And and there Every once in a while, we will have, uh, for those of you who don't know, I, re I recently purchased a church building to have as office space. And one of the things that we're going to do with that space is to occasionally have musicians and other performers come and do events and stuff like that. And I will be taking the Phantom 8 there because if a musician comes and wants to have a keyboard or something like that, I'll be like, by all means, 
here, use the Phantom 8. You are competent to use the Phantom 8. I want you to use the Phantom 8. I'm glad somebody will enjoy the Phantom 8 because every time I look at it, I just see all my failures. A Phantom 8 does sound like a spycraft name. Just Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I, it looks big enough that if you press the right sequence of buttons, it will actually unfold <laughs> into an airplane. On that note, I think let's go ahead and say goodnight to our public viewers. And we're going to go backstage for my Patreon supporters, where I'm about to ask you a bunch of spoiler filled questions about the rest Kibble. of starter villain excellent and and give this poor cat more kibble since clearly she has never received any in her entire life she has never eaten once in her life and honestly i'm appalled i know it's terrible elsie kibble all done